You are listening to The Real Men Feel Show with Andy Grant. Real Men Feel encourages men to allow and express all of their emotions. Despite what you may have been taught, all emotions do serve you. Real Men Feel is committed to engaging in discussions that most men aren't having. All links mentioned in each episode are in the show notes found on the blog at realmenfeel.org. Now, let's get into this week's show. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Real Men Feel. This is your host, Andy Grant. You know, I've often shared my own struggles with depression and suicidal thoughts and, and my whole journey and spiritual growth and, and all that sort of thing. And for years, one of the things people told me was, you gotta love yourself, man. You need more self-love in your life. And I was like, great, the hell do I do with that? <laughs> what does that mean? Um, and now that I've discovered it, I'll, such, I'll catch myself saying that to people too without any sort of follow-up about that. And men especially really don't know what to do with that. So my guest today is midlife dating and relationship coach, speaker and author, Mr. Jonathan Asley. And he knows self-love. And that's what we're here to talk about. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much for having me. I don't know if I know self-love per se, even though I wrote a book about it. I, I say it's an exploration or a journey for sure. Cool. Well, then that, that's a great way to start. Then if, if you're not sure that you've got it yet, so then can you dis describe what, like, what does it really mean to love yourself? Well, you know, it's interesting because I was at a uh, workshop a couple of years ago. I did the Hoffman process, which the best way to describe it, it's an inner child workshop to really heal um, childhood wounds and, 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 and work on uh, negative patterns and limiting beliefs in your life. And one of the experiences I had, and I can't, I can't share it with the details, but I was literally wrapped in a blanket of self-love, like what it felt like to really love myself because I'd done some really, I want to say Herculean inner work and the experience of being able to kind of overcome some of these or first having an awareness of where some of my patterns in my life. And when I talk about negative patterns and limiting beliefs that I've had, whether I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy enough being some of the real core ones, I got to experience what it felt like to love myself. And what I've come to realize that I happen to be a dating and relationship coach. Well, nothing triggers someone's emotion, lack of self-worth as in the dating process. <laughs> I mean, the, the dating process can trigger all kinds of our stuff, our crap, our things like that. And so the concept of self-love to help people out, you know, a lot of times they, they think, oh, is that woo-woo or what does that mean? Well, I like to replace it with words like self-esteem, self-confidence, self-reliance, self-worth, all of these things to nurture ourselves. And what better word than to nurture it with love mm. for ourselves. Cool. And you know, th this, it, I feel silly asking this, but I, th yeah. I think it just, just to clear the air, but like, why would someone want to love themselves? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. So we're just coming off, uh, well, I know this podcast is gonna come back later, but for those listening, uh, I, we're just coming off Thanksgiving weekend. And I happen to spend Thanksgiving day with my son and my dearest family and friends and had a great time. And then all of a sudden, come Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, I found myself hibernating at home, uh, feeling very melancholy, very, feeling very, not depressed, but very sad and blue, because I was by myself. I was feeling really lonely. And here I am a self-love coach, so I kept saying, well, you got to love yourself, Jonathan. You have to love yourself, Jonathan. And in this moment, I was literally feeling incredibly disconnected from myself disconnected to who I was. I was, and, and that's what I feel like loneliness is because we can be in a room full of people and feel lonely. When we're disconnected from ourselves, we're not loving ourselves. So what happened come Monday morning, I said, wait a minute, Jonathan. Okay, I looked at what was going on. I said, you forgot to trust. And I'm like, what do you mean you forgot to trust? You forgot to trust that everything is gonna be okay. I wasn't feeling that way in the moment. I was, I was feeling like my whole life was going to collapse. And, I'm, and all that was was a story I made up in my head. Like, and I, I made up the story that 20 years from now, I'm going to be broke and homeless. That was the story I was living over the weekend. And I just had to remind myself 
that everything is going to be okay. And what I'm really leaning into is faith and trust in oneself. And that I feel like is the is like the essence of what loving ourselves is, is to have faith and trust in oneself. Hmm. That's really beautiful. And you know, for, for me, loving myself doesn't mean I always feel on top of the world and I'm 100% all the time. So kind of what you're describing, I thought, you know, you're going in a different direction, but sometimes loving myself means I'm taking downtime and I am just going to you know, take a nap or hide or, or I, need to, I need to reconnect with myself so I don't connect to others for a period of time. Um, is, is that ever the case for you? Well, I feel like, and by the way, you, 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 I, I just want to put a slight twist on that because what happened was I wasn't loving myself in that moment. And so I was feeling the contrast because you're right. When we're feeling high, when things are going good, you know, we can feel like we're successful and everything. But what I've learned in life, whenever you're feeling really high, you're going to get a corresponding low. That's the yin and yang of life. Balance is so whenever you're feeling really high, you're going to feel really low. So what I try to operate is more on an equilibrium, kind of a, a place of contentment, a balance. But I was out of balance. And being out of balance is the reminder going, ah, you got to love yourself. You have to invest in yourself. You have to nurture yourself. And sometimes we call it self-care. Self-care, you know, for some people might be going getting a massage. Some people self-care might be getting manicures. I know this is a show for men, so I'm, I'm sharing women's stuff because I'm a dating coach for women. But it might be going to play golf, might be doing some of those things, if, if whatever that makes you feel like you're, you're kind of nurturing your body. But it's also self-care of the heart that I want to tap into. Because when we nurture our hearts, that's where we oftentimes get our greatest fulfillment. Mm. It's not so much the outside things. And so even binge watching, that might have been self-care, but I was also isolated. I was also avoiding mm. when I was, I binged watched a lot of TV this bit that week and I was avoiding really stepping into my feelings. So when I leaned into it, I could then address what was really coming up for me. Right. So then it sounds like awareness is a big part of this to realize when am I really nurturing myself and when am I avoiding feeling something? Yes. And, and let's take it even a step further. Awareness is the recognition that everything is happening, that we have created everything that's happened in our lives. And I'd like to even say things are happening for us, not to us. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes people play the blame game or play victimhood. In other words, it's society's fault, it's someone else's fault and all that stuff. And yet, I think one of the greatest self-love practices is to recognize is that you are creating your reality. And that's what awareness is all about. And taking responsibility for it as well. Yeah, that, that's a big one. I mean, I know for myself, for a long, for many years, I, I didn't want responsibility because then I, I misinterpreted that, that. I thought, well, then it's my fault. Then, then I'm to blame for everything. But responsibility just means, well, now we can change it. Yeah. Yeah, when we take ownership, uh, another way of saying is taking ownership, right? Yeah. Responsibility, ownership. In other words, it's, it's mine to take care of. It's not anyone else's responsibility. Mm -hmm. Cool. And you, know, you mentioned how important it was for, for self-care of the heart. And I, I know in your experience, it was a really heartbreaking moment that kind of pushed you deeper into this this exploration um do you want to share that sure 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 so um i mean when i well i have to kind of connect the dots backward a little bit further than what happened last year so um in 2005 i law i i my ex-wife filed for divorce a month later the company i worked for laid me off and and i was making i had a quarter million dollar a year corporate job and then two years later, or three years later, the stock market crashed and I lost a seven figure net worth. And so I literally was in the pit of despair. I mean, I, I went to bed wishing I didn't wake up. Not so much suicidal thoughts, but it was more, I wanted the pain to go away. So in that time though, the movie The Secret came out and Tony Robbins was all over the, you know, the, uh, the internet and, and infomercials and that sort of thing. So 
I began getting back in, getting back into personal development. And I say back because prior to getting married, I was doing a little bit of work in the area of what was called metaphysics back then. But I started to do a deeper dive into personal development, self-help, and spirituality. And I would get, I would read every book I could get my hands on. Wayne Dyer, uh, Michael Singer's Untethered Soul, um, um, uh, Marianne Williamson's Return to Love, um, you know, Abraham Hicks. I mean, the list that goes on and on and on. And I started to do workshops like I just shared, a Hoffman process. And why I'm sharing all this with you is I was bu building up all these resources for myself to really prepare me for what was probably the most devastating thing that's happened in my life. And that was last year, my 19 year old son passed away. And, and anyone who's a parent listening to this, and certainly everyone else can appreciate that for a parent, their worst nightmare is losing a child. And for 19 years, I actually worried about that every single day he was alive and then his brother. So really even longer than that. And now here I'm faced with it. And I remember being at the funeral and I was speaking, uh, I, was, I, was speak, I was doing the eulogy. And in that moment, I said, I'm not gonna spend one day suffering, I'm gonna grieve with love. In other words, I'm gonna choose love as the antidote to any pain and suffering because I know there's no way on earth he would have ever wished me to suffer. And so I began to a practicing. I really started to embrace the word love in my life. And it was two months later that I began writing my book called What the Heck is Self-Love Anyway? Yeah, I, I, I'm totally agreeing with you that, yeah, it was all, all of your learning and growth was in preparation for you to be able to, to really, you know, survive and, and even thrive that, that, um, that most horrible moment that was coming your way. Yeah, I call it a vaccination to chaos, and that yeah. is to really invest in ourselves. You know, I mean, and, and I'm going to be judgmental here for a moment. You know, we, <laughs> this world is caught up with the Kardashians and all the crap on the news and everything else, and yet our self is the most important asset in our lives, and yet the reality is is so few people actually invest. And, and let me just say this. Our emotional well-being is the most important asset in our lives besides our physical body, our emotional well-being. And so I'm a big proponent in investing in one's emotional health. Mm. You know, people spend time, you know, buying vitamins and health supplements and things for their body. What about their heart, their emotional side? That's what I want to lean into most, mm. uh, especially now that I've had this awakening, if you will, after he passed away. Mm. And it, I feel like it's true in my experience and a lot of others, but it, what's your take on it? It seems like most people embark on, you know, a soul searching journey only after a really painful moment. You know, it's interesting. I, I yeah, I, I think that's the sad reality of life is that sometimes we need humbling events. I mean, unless we were trained as children, unless our parents like infused us with personal development when we were growing up which my kids kind of had a little bit of that. I think it takes a humbling event or several humbling events to begin to shift to the awareness of what's really important. And, and let me give you an example. I'm, I'm sure you've gone to a funeral before, right? And I'm yes. sure you've gone to more than one. And have you ever sat there and you heard the eulogy and you're thinking to yourself, I'm not gonna waste one more minute of my life right? You're going to, you're making a commitment. I'm going to make a real commitment to living a better life and not to have regrets and reason, you know, and then three days later, you're back to your normal routine, right. right? And it's in that moment. It's not because it's not your tragedy in that moment. You're hearing about someone else's that you're going to make that change. And then you go back to an old pattern. And so the humbling event oftentimes has to happen to ourselves to really go, what's really important in life? Is it watching the Kardashians? <laughs> uh, or is it investing in my soul? Mm. 
I know a lot of guys don't watch Kardashians, but <laughs> but uh, to some level, maybe not the show, but they they, they know who they are. Right? Okay, or watching, you know, how much poker can you watch? Okay, <laughs> like you know, all star poker. I mean, really, put that energy back into yourself. That's what I'm really here to encourage. Yeah. Now, what about the? Uh, I've heard this kind of of a defense and pushback. The the the. Oh, self-love, that, that selfish and egotistical, you know, putting yourself first or, you know, you got to have to love yourself before you can love anybody else. And like, so how, what, what's your response to that? Well, my response to that's the, the analogy that when you're on the airplane and when the flight attendant tells you, you know, in the case of cabin pressure change, if you're traveling, you know, oxygen masks will drop from the ceiling. And if you're traveling with small children, put the mask on yourself first. It's not the small children. The idea is the oxygen mask is, is giving yourself love first. Because if you can't, if you're, if, if one doesn't give themselves love, how can you spread love to anybody else? Now, does that mean your love cup has to be runneth over to give love to someone else? Absolutely not. It's just get into the practice of having, so let's give you some examples of self-love. Have you ever had an attack thought towards yourself? In other words, I'm not good enough. You, you beat yourself up for something you did. Maybe you got in a car accident. Maybe you, you said something that you regret. Self-love is turning that attack thought, that, that attack towards yourself, and turn around and just say, hey, hey, you're human. Have compassion for yourself. Like Have compassion for those thoughts that are, are negative or hurting yourself and turn it around and loving yourself, just like you would love a little kid if they were saying something bad about themselves, you would go, no, that's not who you are. And for a lot of guys, this is hard stuff to hear. Yeah, I mean, I talk to women mostly, and this is hard for guys, but I can tell you that the strongest thing you can do as a man for yourself is build your emotional heart. Build that part up, not your mind per se, but your heart, because then that makes you powerful. That makes you, for lack of a better word, a real man, hmm. which I'm not a fan of the word real man, but I'm just only saying that only, but what I feel like it means is it's, it's the recognition. A real man is recognition that you are in charge of your destiny. You are responsible for your thoughts and feelings, and you're human and you're going to make mistakes too. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, the, the most consistent messages we have in the show is reminding men that they're humans yeah. and, and all human beings have emotions and have a heart and being, being tough, being real, doesn't mean narrowing that heart into like one or two allowable emotions. And no, you want, actually it's the opposite. If you really want to have a deep dive in life, dive into your emotions, get messy, get real. I just shared with you, I was <laughs> binge watching TV I overate, you know, like I ordered pizza and, and chicken wings and stuff, and I indulged in a lot of crap in my life, but I was digging into the emotions, and I was also to get, I was able to get out of the despair right. because I danced in all that feeling of pain and the reminder that that's not where I want to stay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I say the word reminder. It's important to remind ourselves that we're going to have good days and bad days, and that's okay. It's yeah. okay. Feeling, feeling doesn't mean we're only supposed to feel good. Like once you open your heart, you'll only feel love and joy forever. And you've, you've yeah, unlocked the I mean, secret, right? <laughs> yeah, no, you're gonna, I, I, I was talking, you know, it, it, you know, life is ups and downs and a roller coaster. And to me, it's always been like, life is like the stock market. There are highs and lows, but I, ideally your life is like a growing stock market, you know, higher, higher highs and lower lows. It keeps going on the upward trend. And you but know, every now and then we have a crash. <laughs> Oh my God, I can't begin to tell you, Andy, I was telling my dear friend on Monday what I was experiencing, and that was the exact analogy he said. He goes, dude, you've been on a bull market of self-love for yourself, okay? He goes, and you just had a crash in the market today, and that's okay, because you're going to rise above it, yep. and that's exactly what happened. That's a perfect analogy. Cool. Is, um, but what we don't want to see is your life become a bear market. In other right. words, it's one negative thing after another, after another, and you're hoping for some things. That's what personal development, self-help, and spiritual work does. It helps you traject into, a, for lack of a better word, a bull stock market, and you're going to have these dips. And sometimes they're going to be a crash, and you'll come back up again, too. 
So w- what are some signs that someone doesn't love themselves? You know, it's interesting. The first thing that came to my mind when you said that was when we compare ourselves to others. What was the first thing? Like, in other words, I remember for the longest time, I used to compare myself to my best friend. I mean, he owns a he owns a company with 100 employees, make the business makes $20 million a year. I mean, I, mean, I don't want to say he's rich, but he, you know, he probably brings in a million a year. And I was very jealous of that. And I compared myself to him. And I compared myself to a lot of people throughout my life. And when I let go of comparing myself to anyone else and just looked in the mirror and said, hey, where you're at is okay. Because he's got tons of shit to worry about. He's got 100 employees to worry. He's got, and believe me, I'm not so certain that my lifestyle, which is a fraction of what his, isn't better than his. And that's a comparison too. So I'm saying that a little tongue in cheek. Loving yourself is not comparing yourself to anyone else. I think that's probably one of the fundamental things that I've learned in the last few years. And I, I don't have the exact quote, but I think it's from Wayne Dyer that the only person you should compare yourself to is you in the past. Yeah. Right. And, and, and actually, and that's the thing. Here's the problem. But even comparisons in general because if you had a, okay, so I looked at my past, I used to make a quarter million dollars a year, had a multi-million dollar home and everything. And if I go, oh, compared to then, I'm not where I'm at, I could feel pain. The past is prologue. And so I think letting go of comparisons altogether, because com- when we compare ourselves to others, oftentimes we judge too. Mm-hmm. And we can, and we can be arrogant and, um, in that process too. So I think one of the most loving things we can do is just let go of comparisons altogether. Right. Yeah. Cause some can even be feeling that they're in a very sacred and special place and like, Oh, I have more self than you. Ha ha ha. And I'm loving myself more than that person. Yeah. So it, when we take anything, uh, good, bad, indifferent qualities and are comparing them, then yeah, we're, we're not doing the great work. Yeah. And, and I understand how we might need a barometer in our lives. We might look at something and say, okay, I want to set a standard for myself. And in that, but, but, it, but that's a little bit different than comparison. I think one of the unhealthiest things are um, judgments, comparisons, resentments. Um, there's a few others that come to mind. Lack of trust within oneself. So remember I shared with you, I'm feeling the pit of despair. And what got out of it, for what, I, what helped me get out of it was trusting myself that I'm going to be okay. That was all I had to say was, hey, dude, just remember, you're going to be okay. Remember and have faith that everything is working for you. And little by little, I shifted out of that pit of despair that I was feeling. Is there a particular reason why you think men in particular are, are resistant to this notion and, or practice of self-love? Well, I'm almost certain you've talked about this before, but we weren't conditioned to um, to uh, express our feelings as children. I mean, uh, you know, a real man doesn't express his feelings. A real man stuffs his feelings. He has to be stoic. You have to be strong for everyone else. You can't, you know, it's a sign of weakness if you express your feelings. So we were barraged as, as boys to stuff our feelings. So it's no wonder that um, it's a little bit more of a challenge for us. Now, what's fascinating, though, is that right around midlife is about the time when our testosterone levels begin to decrease and actually our estrogen levels increase in our lives. So we become more in touch with our feelings. But for many men, they're not prepared for it. So their behavior can be chaotic. So that's what they call midlife crisis kind of thing. And that's oftentimes indulging it in the egoic ways Hmm to avoid what's really happening on the inside. And so, you know, the exploration of who am I, why am I here, is that door opening in maybe, or at least I say the word maybe, I say maybe for everyone, I feel like it's a door opening into what you're really all about and an opportunity to love yourself like you would love a little kid. Right, cool. Yeah, one, one good thing in that, it's, it's how we're taught. We, you know, we're taught to repress, not to feel. It keeps being reinforced. Is that since it's learned behavior, anyone can learn the opposite. We, we can learn to feel. 
Yeah, it, it just takes peeling a lot of layers of the onion. And let me be clear, there are some guys listening to this or you know people that are really in deep depression, okay? And just la la, just, you know, when I just cavalierly saying, you know, I'm just gonna change my thought and everything's gonna be okay. I, I recognize that they're also, I, I got a lot of support in my life. I've, I've done therapy, I've done a lot of workshops, I've listened to a lot of CDs, I've done a lot of work. So, um, and I was in that real deep pit of despair. It took little, sometimes it just took a lot of strength just to get out of bed, and I know you can relate to that. So I'm, I'm just suggesting that surround yourself with people that can actually help nurture your life. And if you can't, then go get a therapist or go to a workshop and begin the process. Uh, because once you reach a level where you kind of have, you can be in charge of your own destiny, then when you're having a melancholy day, it's as simple as turning the switch back on the other way. Right. It's, but it's not that way to start. It, yeah. takes, some, it takes some Herculean work. Yeah. Yeah. I find it, it takes practice and, and more conscious effort at first because it's such, it's new to you that you can possibly shift yourself or feel a different way or allow yourself to feel a different way. And yeah. that's when, you know, that, that it's hard and difficult doesn't mean it doesn't work. It just means you're so used to the opposite. Yeah. Um, one other thing for a lot of guys, this might uh, be uh, resonate. So we store up a lot, we can store in our body a lot of negative energy, especially any traumas we have in our childhood. So it's really important to also get that out of your body. And so uh, emotional release work, for those anyone interested, just Google emotional release work, because our body stores a lot of negative traumas we've had in our childhood. And by getting it out of our bodies, it's gonna help take the pressure off of having to do it all from the mind. Hmm. Right, right, yeah. Our, the, our, the cellular memory, I've often heard it called too, as, as, as well. Example. Yeah, exactly. and that's why a lot of guys with a, a strenuous workout or feel greater after a run, and they do let the physical activity kind of lead the way, and their emotions kind of follow, um, as far as their mood does. But, but yeah, hey, that, there's nothing like doing a heavy duty workout to release some endorphins to yeah. feel good. <laughs> cool. cool. And uh, so you've been you've been sharing a lot right now. Are there are there any kind of more techniques for for better understanding or creating a sense of self love that you can share? You know, I'm going to share it like a chapter one in my book, and that's called "Speak Your Truth, Do It with Kindness." Now, when I say the word truth, you know, <laughs> I'm not talking about facts, okay? <laughs> like you know, the sky is blue or whatever, and technically the sky isn't blue. That's light reflecting refracting and whatnot. But um, speaking your truth is about sharing your feelings, do it with kindness. I think it's really important that oftentimes people share their perspective or opinions in life coming from an egoic place that I'm right. Mm -hmm. But how about shifting that to just saying, I'm just gonna share my feelings in such a way and I'm gonna do it with kindness to another human being. I'm a big proponent of kindness and, um, I'm someone I've been studying lately because uh, he's popular in the news right now is uh, Mr. Rogers. And to me, he is the quintessential, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Quintessential uh, descriptor of masculinity. <laughs> now, a lot of people would say, what the heck are you talking about, Jonathan? He, he seemed even effeminate on television. But this is a guy that looked at life on how can I be kind to another human being? And then he stood up for what mattered most to him was saving, you know, like making sure that PBS didn't go um, out of business. So he went up against Congress, which is like a very courageous thing to do because he was a proponent for kindness. And I think one of the most loving thing you can, a person can do is shift to kindness towards oneself and kindness to others and begin to learn to speak in a more kinder, gentler way mm. to people. It, yeah, I often tell, tell clients of mine that, you know, at, at least treat yourself and talk to yourself as well as you would a stranger. Because yeah. for so many people, yeah, the, the way we talk and judge and berate ourselves is just, we would never dare say that to someone else. Yeah. But, but yeah, you know, yeah. And so we start, that's why self-love is, is loving oneself and 
allowing that to go out in the world by loving everyone else or being kind to everyone else. And, and listen, I recognize we have to set boundaries with people you know, that aren't kind to us, and I get that. But we can always come from a heart-centered place, at least make the effort to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to, to be open to treating people well. But again, if they're not there yet, just like, well, good, I, I have love and compassion for you, but I'm not going to hang out with you. So, so, so that's one example. And there's another, uh, there's another chapter in my book. Am I allowed to curse? I can't remember. Or not. Sure. You're encouraged okay. to. Okay. <laughs> so one of the, uh, the, the uh, chapter five in my book is called don't let anyone fuck with your chi. <laughs> and that chapter was birthed after, as I reflected on my son who passed away because he had this unique ability that if, if someone was angry at him, he didn't let it bother how he felt about himself. It was a, I was always fascinated by his ability to kind of be neutral. And so I think in the book of Four Agreements, it's basically don't let anyone else's projections you know, affect how you feel about yourself kind of thing. So it's, I think that's one of the most important lessons to learn is that nobody, don't allow anyone to affect how you feel about yourself. Mm. And so if someone has a, a particular judgment about you, that could, that's most likely just merely a projection on their part. And so by allowing ourselves to understand that when anyone says crap to you, <laughs> that's their shit, not your yeah. shit. Yeah. And don't allow it to give weight in your life because, and by the way, you're talking, you're talking to a person that, I mean, someone could write a Facebook post or write a criticism to me on Facebook and it used to collapse me for a day or two. I literally would shrink. I, my penis would shrink, shrivel up as if they were saying the truth about me. Now I'm like, ah, who gives a fuck? And believe me, I've been, I've been barraged with negativity over the years on some of the stuff I posted. Yeah, I, I, it's funny. We're a very similar path. It, it was the secret that first like, got me um, yeah. on, on the new path of discovery and reading things that I just never, never been taught. Didn't think, you know, wait, my, my thoughts can control my emotions and I can choose my thoughts. And it just like, how, how did no one t tell me this before? Um, but yeah, lo lots of growth and events. And, you know, when, when I first, I think the first video I put on YouTube was kind of me, you know, uh, owning up and confessing to being molested as a child and multiple suicide attempts. And the big fear was like, oh, someone's going to go, oh, you fag, you're, you know, you're such a, you're so gay, you're not, you're not a man. And now when someone does say that, it just makes me laugh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I just feel for them and I'm like, oh, well, you know, but uh, yeah, it is, it is funny that it, it's almost, and if, if, if we're not loving and nurturing ourselves, we're, we're such like this open vessel that the judgments and name calling and blame from someone else will, will take it. Will, oh yeah, that's me. Well, I'll put that in my empty cup of love. At least someone's thinking about me, even if it's harshly, you know, at yeah. least that was my experience. You know, it's sad, you know, like before you're just sharing someone judging your experience, you know, like I, I guarantee you that person who judged you or called you, you know, the names that you shared, wouldn't want to trade one moment for the childhood you had, <laughs> what you've had to experience. And so it, it, it really, it behooves everyone to really step into the idea of putting ourselves in someone else's shoes because we, and, and quite frankly, we, we can't even know what shoes they walked in unless we start to ask questions and mm -hmm. find out. And sadly you had to experience um, the, you know, um, abuse as a child, but it's also the door opener to how you're loving on yourself today. And that was the experience that happened for you. For others, it's a different experience. Um, but they're all, any negative thing that happens in our life is that opportunity, especially as adults, is an opportunity to love on ourselves. Yeah. And, um, and, Fuck those who call you names. <laughs> yeah. And that's I mean, being mean too, so I take that back. <laughs> but it, it, I mean, it, and it, this is something I always heard, and it took a long time to really own it and see it, but there's always a gift in our shit. You know, yeah. the, the toughest times can bring about the greatest benefits. Um, you know, it's interesting. Before my mother passed away, I want to say she was about 80 years old. And, um, and my, the highlight of my mom's day was the, 
Barker Lounger, Hallmark Movie Channel, and Game Show Network, okay? And someone called and, and, and pissed her off on the phone. And, but it didn't seem to aggravate her. And I go, like, Mom, how'd you let that roll that off your shoulder, so to speak? And she goes, by the time I reached 80, I didn't give a shit anymore. <laughs> and I'm like, but what I, what I learned in that is, why do we have to wait till 80 to get there? Why not learn that much sooner in life? How can we learn to have not let others' opinions of ourselves or judgments not, not affect our lives? The sooner we learn that, the happier or more content of a life we begin to live. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, 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 it's very true. And you know, all, all this reminded me of, of, of another, I can't remember where this saying comes from, but it's that you can be right or you can be happy. Yes. And, and growing up, I was like, oh, I've got to be right. And you know, life sucks, then you die. And I am so right about this. Don't try to convince me otherwise. I'm like, wait a minute, I can just choose to be happy. And yeah, I, I love discovering I'm wrong about things I used to believe. Um, so yeah, it's, it, and, but it is a choice we can make. So you said something earlier, I, I didn't really get to touch upon it. We talked about ego and, and this really piggybacks on right or wrong. So, you know, the, there's the healthy ego is basically, ego is self, right? And self and the healthy self is nurturing and loving on oneself. So I, I'm a big proponent on that. Unhealthy ego is that place of I've got to be right. I've got to you know, it's, it's really the differentiating between right or wrong. Mm. And I think unhealthy ego wants to be right or wants things their way. And it's, it tends to be the one-sided street. That's where I think unhealthy ego is. And what's interesting is ego so sneaky that it can convince you that you're being loving when you're actually an ego. Mm. You know, uh, and I witness this every day. I actually witness this from a lot of women uh, in the dating realm because they think that they're on some level they can be givers in a relationship, but that giving is coming from an egoic place because they want to get from the giving. Right. And so the ego is sneaky to convince you, oh no, it's altruistic. When it actually, when you take a step back, it's coming from a selfish place, not a selfless place. Right. Yeah. So if, if, if that, if someone in that state with the really strong uh, negative ego was giving, giving, giving and not getting something returned, they'd be, they'd be furious. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But that's, that's ego saying I deserve something instead of just being a giver for the sake of giving. Yeah. Yeah. There's the sense of you owe me not, Oh, I feel good yes. for giving. And yeah. that's ego. So that's an example of ego that I yep. wanted to share. Yeah. No, cool. Well, since you mentioned, uh, you know, working with, with women more and in, in, in your, uh, your role as a, a dating coach, so as a way to encourage more men to explore self-love or resilience or worth or confidence, what are some of the common complaints you, you hear from women about the men that they're meeting in the dating world? Well, gosh, I mean, <laughs> how long of a show do we have? <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of their biggest complaints of men are inconsistent and emotionally unavailable. They're inconsistent with their actions and that they're not truly available or committed in the relationship. And so, and, and I actually feel for women on this particular case because, you know, I remember in my twenties when I was dating, I was raised with the, I mean, I was raised the following I, after high school, go to college, after college, get a job, after getting a job, meet a girl, meet a girl, get married and start a family. I was programmed that way. And so what was interesting was I was in my 20s, I was on a hunt for a wife. And so the way I approached dating was it wasn't just about my own needs, you know, in other words, my selfish needs of wanting sex and whatnot. I was really approaching it from a more conscious place. Well, now men in their 40s and 50s, Many people don't want to get remarried, so they're not, they're just looking for the experience and not recognizing that there's another human being that might get attached to you if you're just having a, you're just, oh, I just want to have fun, I want to have a good time, I want things casual, and someone else might really want something deeper. And I think that's what often men do, is they stop being on a search for a wife, and I'm being blunt here, you know? <laughs> Because if you want to be in a relationship, then do it for the long term. And just because you're being honest with a woman doesn't mean it's right, going back to right or wrong, mm -hmm. because someone might get very attached to you. 
And so, especially when we have sex and, you know, connection and whatnot. So, and by the way, for the guys listening, I know women can act exactly the same way. So I'm not making this a right or wrong. I've just observed more men not being truly honest with themselves. And by a byproduct, you're actually hurting another human being. Mm -hmm. And then, then the idea Does that of- that makes sense, by the way? Yeah, no, no, I, I get it. Okay. But I want to dig deeper into emotional unavailability. Sure. And and because I'm I'm sure it's not it's not a one size fits all sort of thing. So uh, I'm sure some of it is guys resistant to building their heart, resistant to building their strong emotional core. Yeah. And then others, I you know, this feels truer for me and and friends that have spoken about this to me. Emotional unavailability, so that they don't get hurt. And I, I won't let you get in so that when this ends, I can walk away and not feel as hurt as I might. Yeah, I, here's the thing. You know, women might criticize men for being emotionally unavailable. Every man is capable of sharing and expressing his emotions. Now, oftentimes we men haven't learned the languaging around how to express our emotions. So sometimes it's difficult for us to express. So for the guys listening um, and women, I highly recommend Googling a list of feelings. And there's a hundred lists of feelings. And why that might be important to look at is it might help you with the languaging of expressing your feelings. And so, and, and sometimes feelings aren't facts. This is the other thing. Feelings aren't facts. Our feelings can change constantly. I just shared with you, I was feeling melancholy and then I'm feeling good the next day. I mean, literally feelings are like, like the ocean, they come and go. And, um, but I'm a really big encourager uh, for men in particular, start to learn, just read, look at the words, you know, like anxiousness and, and generosity and compassion, start looking at different feeling words and start leaning into them and incorporating them in your languaging. Because that's what helps when you're feeling stuck, is just grab the word that feels closest to what you're experiencing in that moment. Yeah. 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 And another, like I, I've, I've done that, that exercise. And another thing that's helped me often was a thesaurus. Yeah. <laughs> like, every, you know, everything I, I, you know, if everything I feel, I'm calling it all anger. Well, all right. What are the words for that? Like, oh yeah, I'm closer to that. Oh yeah. There's, you know, there's, there are vagaries. There's a spectrum. Every emotion has a spectrum within it. Yeah. That's a great, I do that all the time too. I pull up the thesaurus. So I'm like, okay, well that's, let me, oh, oh, that's the word that feels close. That's the yeah. feeling that feels closer. Yeah. Cool. So uh, you've, you've mentioned a lot of different books and talked about many programs you've gone through. D does anything stand out as, as a habit, a practice, a, a program that, that, you, uh, that has helped you a lot that you want to share? Yeah. So my all-time favorite book uh, to this day is The Untethered Soul by Michael Singer. And to me, I mean, I'm, this is my words. It's my Bible. And why I love this book so much is I, I believe it helped me talk to the voices in my head. <laughs> and I don't mean schizophrenic voices like different persons, but quite frankly, we are all a multitude of personalities within ourselves. We have different personalities and different ways of approaching a variety of different things in our lives. So what I loved about the book, and I gave it to my 23 year old son, which you know, I'm so happy. He's he goes, God, this book is really helping. And I'm like, that's great to hear. And I gave this book to a friend of mine, a male that the business owner I shared with you earlier, who was Mr. Stoic, Mr. I don't share my feelings to anybody kind of guy. And he read that book. And then this is a guy who reads more mystery novels and things like that. And I gave him a self-help book and he goes, holy shit, this so resonates with me. This book to me is a life changer. It's a game changer. Mm -hmm. And that foundation from what that book has to offer, I think can build uh, success in one's life in ways you can't even imagine. Beautiful, cool. Is, is there one thing kind of top of mind that you wish more men knew? <laughs> uh, well, I, I guess it comes back to loving yourself. I don't know why. I mean, that's the coming full circle to that is that loving on yourself, being compassionate for oneself. Um, well, actually, let me, okay. 
I do, or let me shift what I'm about to say. I am such a huge proponent of personal development, self-help and spiritual work that it, the most, if I wish more men knew this, is that it must become a daily practice in one's life if you want to feel a deeper sense of inner peace. Make it a daily practice in your life. And I, whether that's meditation as one source and, and self-care is, you know, self-care is about the body, but I'm talking about your emotional heart mm -hmm. and begin to do an immersion into reading books and watching videos and whatever resonates with you. And one author might resonate with you in a year from now, it might be totally, you might find someone different and that one moves on. Allow yourself a journey to discover who the heck you really are. Find out why, who am I and why am I here? And a lot of men don't do this, and that's my invitation for every man, is start doing it because the most masculine thing you can do is to love on yourself because it's going to radiate outward to everyone else as well. Right. That, that's beautiful. I've, I don't think I've heard it quite that way. And when you phrase it like that, it's kind of, yeah, the – to be the manly leader and provider and caretaker. Yeah, coming from love, it all flows easier. Yeah, I mean, I, I told you, know, I shared Mr. Rogers is like my rock star right now. And outwardly, people aren't gonna see that, you know? Uh, <laughs> but to me, what he represents is what I think on an individual basis, when one begins to strive to love on themselves and then also, and, and, outwardly too in other words you don't keep it to yourself right. it's you give it to yourself and then and then pay it forward kind of thing everyone benefits and so I, and by the way i'm in the dating realm where there's so much crap and game playing that goes on in the dating realm and there's so much expectation our men are supposed to do this and women are supposed to do that and i say fuck you to all that i am the contrarian i'm all about um two people treating the process as a two-way street and not this hierarchy that's been talked about, which is pointless anyway, because there's so many miserable relationships when that, that hierarchy exists. Two people should show up fully engaged to being who they are, expressing what they want, being loving to other people, and not make it up, men are supposed to do this and women are supposed to do that. Kind right. of. So it kind of comes down to, you know, recognizing your programming of go to college, get a job, settle down, um, inviting people in the dating world to throw away the programming that they've got on what a date's supposed to be or how a relationship's supposed to work. Or, yeah. yeah, I am such an, I'm a contrarian. Like I'm all about, you know, it, when a man takes you out on a date, the woman should treat the next time uh, and, and vice versa. Because quite frankly, the reason why a woman should treat is it gives him an opportunity to receive love from someone else and generosity and if we're able to give and receive e you know equally and i don't mean equally in the sense of dollar amounts i'm just saying equal in effort when effort is equal and balanced it becomes a much deeper richer relationship cool. and i'm a big proponent of that yeah yeah awesome um but sadly ego wants things a traditional society a lot of ego the ego gets so trapped in traditional and societal expectations instead of saying, fuck, what do I want to be and how do I want to operate? And just go from, and, and being loving and kind to, and to others as well. Jonathan, what are you proud of? <sighs> you know, it's interesting. At first I was going to say my, my son, but my son who's alive, but um, I'm very proud of, I'm pr proud of both boys. Um, but what came to mind was, this sounds egotistical <laughs> in a way, but I'm really proud of how I navigated the loss of my son. I'm really proud of that. I'm proud that I really faced the pain head on and I'm grateful that I didn't allow the pain to define who I am in a negative way. I certainly have taken the pain and put it outward, I feel like in a very positive way by writing a book and sharing my experiences and leaning into the conversation of love. I mean, 
most men, that word is foreign in their daily lives. In fact, I'm going to say that for both most men and women. And I'm a big champion for love. And that was birthed through the loss of my son. And so I'm really proud of being a champion for love. And I don't mean romantic love. I'm just saying love of self and love of humanity. Yeah. No. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And that, you know, that resonates very true. Um, just in the, the, the brief interactions we've had in, until today and, and right now that, that, yeah, that's like, I'm proud of that for you too. Right? Oh, thank <laughs> you. I'm digging on us becoming friends, by the way, you are one totally cool dude. So I really appreciate that. Cool. And, uh, what are you looking forward to? What, what's coming up? Or what no, do you hope that's coming funny. up? I did a podcast earlier and they go, what's, what's on score, store for, you know, the 2020. And interestingly enough, I don't, I don't make plans or goals. I, I let go of that. Um, and don't get me wrong, I have aspirations and desires in my life, um, but I don't set out with a goal or plan. I set out by love, like how can I love more myself and others? And I know for a lot of guys, this is gonna sound like bullshit, right? But I literally do this every day. I literally lean into how can I be more loving to myself and others every day. And believe me, I have, it's like that stock market we talked about. <laughs> um, but that's like, how can I have more love in my life and, uh, and those around me? And, and I do occasionally call out when I don't see people loving and reminder of how can, how can it be done in, how can things be done in a more loving way? And let me give you an example. When I see, um, I just did a post, I call it toxic posting. And it's where uh, someone covertly or blatantly bashes or shames another sex or gender to make the other gender look good. I see this a lot on Facebook. And like, I'm now a proponent of calling that out. <laughs> Because there's no value in blaming or shaming a sex just to make another sex look good. And, uh, and this kind of relates to some of the, the, the elements of what's happened to me too and whatnot. So I'm just here to really be an advocate for more love and less blaming and shaming. Cool. Cool. Is there anything else we haven't touched on that you want to share today? I, like I said, I could talk for hours. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I just want... I, I guess my invitation, okay, here's one. I was at the grocery store yesterday and it turned out the person in front of me, credit card didn't work. And, and I said, I'll pay for it. Um, and it turned out what they could have, they were able to Venmo it or whatever. So they were able to figure out what was wrong with their credit card. But in that moment, I thought, how can I be generous to another human being? And why I'm sharing this is, I'm really a big proponent of paying forward. How can, think of ways, this is my invitation for everyone on this call or this podcast. And that is, think of ways you can pay stuff forward. Just begin to have that in your consciousness. And I mean total strangers, not the people you love in your life. Because imagine, I, I love that movie, Pay It Forward. And imagine what this world would be like if everyone just started to do that every single day, the best they could. And um, I know that sounds probably idealistic, or I, what's the word I'm thinking of? Idealist? You know the word I'm thinking of. I can't say it right now. My tongue is tied. But that's what I'd like to see happen more of, is a lot of pay it forward. Cool. Cool. Now, I know that there, you're, you, uh, you're giving away the first two chapters of the book, What the Heck is Self-Love Anyway? So, so how yeah. can people take advantage of that? Sure. So I'm sure there'll be a link here in the show notes somewhere yeah. like that. But um, uh, you can go to um, the, the link in the show notes or you can go to Amazon. Uh, my book is there if you'd like to check out. I think the first chapter's on there as well um, and see if it resonates with you. Um, and then my website, jonathanasley.com for the for the, for the women listening, that's a great place to go, but for guys too. And you can find me on social media um, as well. Awesome. Um, I've really enjoyed everything you, you brought today. Uh, I'm proud of the work you're doing. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, yeah, it, it's, it's sad that it's, it was a tragedy that kind of had you go deeper, but it's also glorious in a sense. 
Yeah, you know, I mean, I miss that guy every day, but yeah. boy, has he infused me with love in ways I can't even begin to imagine. So, like you said before, um, oftentimes it's through our, our tragedies that we find our greatest blessings. So, um, and let's not always have it be a tragedy to find our greatest blessings. Right, right, let's right. be in gratitude and appreciation every moment of the day because sometimes things are going to happen out of our control. So, yeah. um, Gratitude and appreciation is the is really the multivitamin to inner peace. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Yeah, I've been keeping a gratitude journal now daily since I think I started in two thousand eight, and uh, yeah, it 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 works. <laughs> yeah. Oh, do we have enough time? I can share a quick story. Sure. Okay. So so just to give you the, uh, I just want to go back to gratitude. I. I was in a significant relationship some years ago and we were actually going to a speaking event, her and I, we were speaking on, the topic was called, um, we need to talk, bringing up the touchy subjects. And she was a relationship therapist or is a relationship therapist or doctor. And the night before we were supposed to speak, we got into a terrible fight. I mean, over something ridiculous. I mean, it really was, well, I mean, to her, it wasn't that ridiculous, but we got into this, I mean, fight where she wanted to get on an airplane and leave. Like we, we flew down to speak at an event and she wanted to leave that night. So something switched in me. And I, I mean, we're yelling at each other and I just took three deep breaths. And I don't know what made me come up with it. I go, you know what, Sherry, what I'm most grateful for in you? And I recited five things I'm incredibly grateful for from her. And as I'm saying one after another, after another, I could see the ice beginning to melt from her. And then I said, would you be open to sharing what you're grateful for with me? And by the time she got to the fifth one, the ice had melted. We could kind of come back to a loving space and we were able to work through our stuff because all that armor and that negativity was gone. And that's what, and so by the way, so it turned out our whole speech became the fight. Like the, <laughs> that became the talking point. <laughs> I mean, talk about the universe co conspiring to work in your favor, right. Right? right? I mean, that's literally what happened. So um, it is such a powerful expression of love to be able to express gratitude and appreciation for another human being and for oneself. So um, I just, thanks for letting me take an extra minute to share that story. No, beautiful, Maybe. beautiful. No, so yeah, I, I appreciate your time here. Everybody listening, I appreciate your time listening. And yeah, on realmenfield.org in the show notes, we'll have links to, so you can connect with Jonathan and all the social media platforms and check out his book, What the Heck is Self-Love Anyway? And wherever you're finding Real Men Field, please give us some love with, with a share, a comment, a review, a like, uh, spread the good word. And until we talk next time, be good to yourself. Thank you for listening to Real Men Feel. Reach out to us at realmenfeel at gmail.com. Learn more about Andy Grant at theandygrant.com. Until next time, visit realmenfeel.org or the Real Men Feel Facebook group and share what you thought of this episode. Please give this podcast a review on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you are discovering Real Men Feel.